Let's restart this. All right. All right, all right, all right. So, hello and welcome, everybody. If you're new here, hey, what's up? I'm Liz, your creepy and awkward Mormon friend, here with another episode of my 25 Days of True Crime here on Create and Crime Time. Now, what I do is I will create a piece of art and talk about a true crime story at the same time. Um, so today we're kind of talking about two different cases together and the reason why they're together is because they believe that one is actually the other one so they're two in the same. And the case we're talking about today is Herbert Baumeister and the I-70 Strangler. Now, if you've never heard of either of them, the span of crimes was between 1980 and 1995, I believe. That was the full span of crimes. We're going to go a little bit into the I-70 Strangler first. I do have a list of all of the victims that were found associated with the I-70 Strangler. There are men that were missing in regards to the I-70 Strangler because all of them had a definitive, like, they all had a similarity. They were all last seen in and around gay bars in the, in the areas in between Indiana and Ohio, generally around Indianapolis. They were, it was like a four block radius in Indianapolis where they were last generally seen and some of them are friends or were friends while they were living and disappeared so it's kind of like all over the place when it comes to the I-70 Strangler because they never definitively found out who he was. It's only really tied like they believe it's Herbert Bomeister, but there's no definitive like that he did it because he is dead. And we'll never fully, we'll never fully know if he was the I-70 Strangler. So the I-70 Strangler, their that span of crimes was between 1980 and 1991, and they stopped abruptly. This is another reason why they believe it's Herbert Baumeister, is because Herbert Baumeister moved to the Fox Hollow Farms in 1991. So. There's a lot, I'll get into that in itself when we go into Herbert Bomeister. The first body that was discovered was Michael Petrie and he was 15. Now he was discovered naked. I do want to clarify something in advance. Most of these, all of these victims were strangled to death and that's why it's called the strangler. Um, and it was from ligature um, strangulation. So something was used to strangle them. And most of them have the common denominator of last being seen in or around gay bars. They, in the Indianapolis area, they were um, using themselves like as means for money, so prostituting themselves. Some did have a background with drugs. Some were unknown to have like been living in a gay lifestyle by their family, um, and just little things here and there about like it's it's those similarities that really tie all these all these victims together so and even with the array and age now the victims were young so Michael is 15 and the oldest would be like late 20s The, ab the oldest victim that it was a found victim is 42, so early teens to the age of 42. So it's not like there was a definitive age range. It was the targeting of these men was primarily because of where they were, what lifestyle they had, what they were doing, and who took them is... That's what they were drawn to. That's basically what I'm saying. So Michael Petrie was 15. He was discovered in Hamilton County. Um, and this was on the 16th of June in 1980. And his body was naked. 
So despite his young age, he was known to have prostituted himself and he did this frequently at gay bars in the area. He went missing on the 7th of June, but he was seen on the 10th of June riding around in a stranger's car. So that was like the definitive last time somebody had seen him. After Michael was discovered, the next body that was discovered was Maurice Taylor and Maurice Taylor was topless so he had bottoms on just you know nothing on the top so and also this is this is my husband's desk I wanted a different backdrop and uh, you know felt festive because the tree's right there so Maurice was discovered in July of 1982 now he was discovered in Weasel Creek, and this is also in Hamilton County. He lived in a boiler room in the apartment building. Um, that, like, that's where he resided, was he stayed in the boiler room. And this is because he didn't have any financial stability. So he turned to supplementing that uh, with providing sex for money at gay bars. So he get like just like Michael Maurice found a way to help with his income by prostituting himself and for him he remained unidentified for eight months and the reason being is because his mother was actually hospitalized and she never filed a missing persons report until like after she was released which is really sad She's hospitalized, doesn't even know that her son is missing, and then she finds out that he's dead after she's hospitalized. Yeah. So, um, Delvoid Lee Baker is the next to be found. He was 14, so he was an 8th grader. Um, he was found semi-nude in a river in Hamilton County. Now, he was also known to have prostituted himself if he had no money so he could do what he wanted to do. Uh, when he was out with his friends. His parents reported him missing when he didn't come back for his 10 o'clock curfew on the 2nd of October of 1982. And he would be found shortly after that in 1982. So Michael Riley was 22. He went missing on the 28th of May 1983 and this was after he was visiting the Vogue Theater. Now this also has another name but this was known to have been a gay movie house. That's what it's listed as. Now I don't like throwing the word gay out <laughs> um, as much as I have been in this, but that's literally written in fact that it's that's what it's being called is a gay movie house. Um, and he was last seen with an unidentified male that nobody knew who he was. His body was found nude and his body was found in a ditch in Hamilton County, uh, Hancock County, sorry, on the 5th of June in 1983. So he was strangled. They noted that he was strangled with a towel or something that was similar in fabric wise to a towel. Eric Allen Rodiger was 17. Now he vanished on the 7th of May 1985 and he was found shirtless in a stream in Preble County, Ohio. He was last seen accepting a ride from a blanket passing by car. Now he was waiting for the bus. So his family thought that he was, um, basically going to like interviews that day, but he never, he never went to any of them. And when he was found, they noticed that there was an apparent burn mark on his body and he was strangled by a rope. Michael Allen Glenn would be next to be found. He was 29 and his body um, was only clothed in underwear and he was discovered in a ditch in Eaton, Ohio in um, August of 1986. Now he was a handyman and he especially worked in like the Indianapolis area really helping those that needed help around their house and stuff like that but they don't know when he actually went missing because I mean you're a handyman you're gonna be gone for periods of time especially if you're working on somebody's house so there's no definitive like to know when he went missing um, and 
strangulation was again the cause of death for his case. So, um, and he wasn't identified for three years. They finally identified him in 1989 via fingerprint analysis. So that was finally like a good thing in, especially in the media when he was finally identified so that his, his family could know. Uh, James Robbins was 21. He went missing on the 15th of October 1987. Now he went missing around 10 p.m. from his mother's house and he would be found two days later. His naked body was found in a ditch in Shelby County. Uh, Jean-Paul Talbot is our next that would be found and he was found in May in 19, 1981. Um, well he would be the first one to be found. I kind of just like wrote them. Wait, is that right? I don't think that's right. John Paul Talbot. Found. wrote that wrong. So uh, Jean-Paul Talbot is our next to be found. He was found in May of 1989. He was dumped near a stream in Defiance County, Ohio. Um, Stephen L. Elliott, he's 26. Now his body was found to only be in underwear and he was found in August of 1989. So those ones are super close in time. Uh, Clay Russell Boatman is 32. He was an LPN who was discovered in August of 1990. And he was... He... He disappeared after leaving his apartment with a friend. And he was going to a local bar called Our Place. And it was a very, like, well-known gay bar in the area. And unfortunately, he would be found in a ditch near Eaton, Ohio, and he would be found by a group of children. So, I mean, I feel really bad for the kids that found his body, especially what that could have done to his mind. Um, Thomas Clevenger Jr., he's 19. Uh, he vanished in August of 1990 as well, and his semi-nude corpse was found at an abandoned railroad track, and this was near Greenf Greenville, Ohio. Now, the last one that was found, his name is Otto Gary Becker, and he's our oldest um, known victim of the I-70 killer. Um, he was 42, and his body was found in Henry County, Indiana, in 7th of October, 1991. So, as all these bodies were being found, they had a team of investigators, and in, oh, not even just in Ohio but in Indiana that were trying to like put the puzzle together of why they were being killed and how are they all related. They knew that it was a serial killer, they just didn't know definitively like what was happening. So other, there were other missing cases that happened around this time and they were Gary Davis, then there was Dennis Brogy, Brogy. I'll spell it B-R-O-T-Z-J-E. Um, John Roach and Dennis McNeve. These were other missing men in the area. Um, that they all went missing generally like in the same time frame. Um, but they hadn't been recovered yet. So investigators also took note that these bodies stopped being found in 1991. Now, like I mentioned before, this possibly could be if Herbert Bomeister is the I-70 Strangler, then this is because he moved to the Fox Hollow Farms in Indiana in 1991. So, 
now that we have kind of discussed the i70 strangler let's go into herbert bowmaster <sighs> this man this man is like i don't even know like you know how people say that if they generally help people with their mental health and things won't happen well this this case literally is one of those. If his parents would have helped him with his mental health, then he would have been on a good regiment. I think he would have been fine. And, but that's coulda, woulda, shoulda. <sighs> All right, so who is Herbert Baumeister? So he was born on the 7th of April in 1947 in Indianapolis, Indiana. He's the oldest of four children to Herbert Sr. and Elizabeth Baumeister. His childhood was severely normal. His father was a doctor. Um, they lived a very good childhood, except for the fact that Herbert, he, uh, he started developing some antisocial behavior. He wasn't, like, he didn't have a lot of friends. Um, he would rather be playing with dead animals than people so there was one incident that something about like him playing with dead animals occurred around school and he would be like talked to by a teacher well for him getting revenge on the teacher he ended up peeing on that teacher's desk and another occasion after that he would bring a dead bird to school and play with it. Uh, during his teenage years, he would be diagnosed with schizophrenia, but his parents refused, refused to accept that he was schizophrenic, and they did not get him the treatment that he needed. I swear, if Parents need to pay more attention when it comes to mental health, especially for your children, because you don't know what effect your child will have on, like, on others in the future. You, you seriously do not know, and it, that is quite terrifying. Well, well, let's, let's, let's get a little more into, uh, Mr. Herbert. Well, so he, in 1965, he would attend Indiana University, but he would drop out um, eventually his parents were, like, his parents got super pissed that he dropped out because his dad wanted him to follow in his footsteps. Well, Herbert was just like, I mean, not going to say that he was weird, but he was generally weird. He didn't have any friends. He preferred to just be, like, by himself or around dead things. Like, he just... He had very bizarre behavior. Um, he eventually would go back to college and he would meet his future wife Julie um he did go like after he met Julie Julie he would drop out of college again he did go back to college for studying anatomy but and that was in 1972 and this was at Butler University but he would again drop out um so in his adult years he would drift drift through job to job and his only real, like, permanent job he had would be at the DMV, so the Department of Motor Vehicles, and he got this job because of his dad. Like, I, he, so, thankfully his dad got him this job. He did have a strong work ethic, but because of his behavior, People noticed it at work. It was like really bizarre behavior. Um, he would marry Juliana Slater. That's his wife, Julie. They would marry in 1971 and they would eventually have three children together. So I did find a fact <laughs> that Julie did state like after everything about like the murders came out and um, is that they only had sex six times. While they were married and they were married for over 25 years that sucks it sucks and they had three kids so three out of the six times they had sex they they made children oh no 
We'll leave the hair down today. No bun. All right. So, um, in 1972, he would be committed to a psychiatric hospital. Now, this would be after uh, Julie reached out to his dad, and she said that he was hurting and he needed help. Yeah. So, time goes by. They have their children. In 1984, Herbert would lose his job. And he lost his job at the DMV. Julie had no idea why he got fired from his job at the DMV. But this subsequently happened after they had their third child. So after the child was born, Herbert became a stay-at-home dad and Julie went to work. Now when she went to college, she studied journalism. So um, it's believed that she went back and she went into a career with journalism. Um, but... With Herbert being a stay-at-home dad, he quickly turned to alcohol to kind of like subdue those feelings that he had, that uh, his antisocial behavior, he just wanted to like normalize himself, so he began to drink. And with his drinking, he would go out and frequent bars, and not just regular bars, he would go to the many known gay bars in the area, in the Indianapolis area. And... Because of his drinking in 1985, he would be arrested for aggravated DUI after hitting a pedestrian. But he would be uh, let go with a warning. Not even six months later, he would be arrested again, and this would be for Grand Theft Auto. Now he stole his friend's car, and again, he would quickly be let go. <sighs> yeah. So, not too long after that, he gets a job, and he starts working in a thrift store, and while he's here, I mean, it's not the best job, but it gives him an idea of, hey, they're recycling clothing that's used, I can use this in my own business. So this is when he comes up with the idea to open a Save-A-Lot, and his wife helps him, Julie helps him, and this turns out to be super successful. They open this business in 1988 and they end up having three different locations between Indiana and Ohio. And because of this success in 1991, he ends up being able to buy a $1 million estate called Fox Hollow Farms. This is an 18 acre estate and it's 11,000 square feet. This building is massive, supremely massive. The whole, like, area used to be full-on farms and, like, horse farms and stuff like that. So, they, he was able to, like, give his family the life that they deserved, but he still was not feeling normalized, we'll say that. And Julie would notice his strange behavior, his severely strange behavior, and she started noticing it more and more in 1994, and things would become, like, it's not even just strange, he would get more to the bizarre point, like, his bizarre behavior was coming back out again, and because of this, they, it put a lot of a strain on their marriage, so it's also known that in 1994, their son, now mind you, he's 13 at the time, he finds a human skull in the woods surrounding their house. And after he finds this, he brings it back home and he shows his mom. Well, obviously, I mean, what would you do if your child brings home a skull? Like, I mean, I would be freaked out. So she asked him to lead her to the skull, and there in the woods she finds a pile of bones. Well, with Herbert, he has been grooming his family to, or trying to groom them to make them only inform him if something happens instead of going straight to the authorities. So after she sees the pile of bones, she confronts Herbert, and Herbert tells her that it's an anatomical skull, uh, anatomical skeleton that was at his father's practice. Well, 
with Herbert, he was known as a pack rat and they had a lot of stuff in their house and a lot of stuff was like stacked to the ceiling and especially in the garage. Well, what was in the garage was the actual true anatomical skeleton that was from his father's practice. That anatomical one found in the woods was actually a human skeleton. It wasn't a fake one. So Herbert just kind of like brushed it off as that. Julie found it a little weird, but didn't really think of any anything of it because that, I mean, Herbert had a an answer for when she asked like what it was. So it wasn't like something like super, super out of the ordinary. You catch my drift? All right, so. In 1990, the Marion, Marion County Sheriff's Off Department was investigating the disappearances of men. So like I was talking about with the men that disappeared along with the I-70 Strangler. And the, between 1990 and 1992, this is when they were noticing that there was a similarity between height, weight, and age of all these gay men that were going missing in the area. And then also we have all the men that they were discovering being ditched in, near water, near the I-70, in ditches throughout the 80s. Like, so everything was kind of like coming together piece by piece by piece. Well, everything kind of like shifts for the better. A man named Tony Harris, now this is his, this is his alias, we don't know what his real name is. He contacts them and he informs them that his friend, Roger, he believes that a man named Brian Smart killed Roger. And he believes this because Brian Smart is a known, like, kind of a known patron at the gay bars in the area and he, he went with him to his house so while he went to him went with him to his house uh brian attempted to kill tony with a pool hose and this was during an auto erotic asphyxiation session so if you don't know what that is, it's when you strangle somebody while you are having sex. And it enhances your euphoria while you're in the act. If you didn't know that, if you didn't want to know that, I, so I am sorry. But that's what it is. And that's what Herbert liked, is he liked that sense of the autoerotic asphyxia and that euphoria that you experience. And while this was happening, that's when he would, sh like, strangle them and kill them. Well... This didn't happen with Tony. Um, he would wake up after passing out and he was able to get away. So, at first, they didn't believe Tony's story and they would talked to him again in 1995 and this is after Tony would see Brian and he saw him get into a car and what he did was he ended up writing down the license plate number and giving that to the police. Now with this, this is why, this is how they find out his true identity. He's not Brian Smart, he is Herbert Baumeister. So he's using an alias that way nobody knows about his secret lifestyle that he closeted himself for a very long time he didn't want to like express his true nature of his sexuality and he wanted to do right in the eyes of everybody around him like be that normal family man Baumeister was not very well known in the area as like that family man that quiet family man granted he had strange behavior but he was known in the area I mean I watched a news <laughs> like a little news clip of him talking about how a raccoon was talking about how like 
you know how people paint the pavement, like the lines on the pavement? Well, there was a raccoon that got painted over because people didn't pay attention that there was a raccoon on the side of it. And I watched the clip and I'm just like, how did they not pick up on his creepiness? Like, look at him. <sighs> I mean, granted, there's some freaky looking people in this, in this world, but damn. You can see it in his face. There's something off about him. That's that's how it is with a lot of serial killers. There's something off about them, and you just don't you don't realize it until you see what's happened. So Herbert or Herb, that's what he liked to be called. When he's with Tony Harris, before like before he sees him again herbert confides in him that he has killed 50 to 60 people and this is i mean it's not like fully corroborated that he did kill 50 to 60 people um i mean there's a lot that they find on his farm but and he also Tony also knows, knows that Herb is a serial videographer. He literally took a video of everything. So keep that in mind that videotapes are something that can be crucial in this case. And just keep that like in the front of your brain. So after... Tony sees him in his car and then gives the plate number to the police. Um, they ID him as Herb Baumeister. So, it wouldn't be until 1996 when they get to actually search his farm. And this is after his wife contacts the police. Now, so because the police were already investigating him, they realized that the alias he was using was just his cover. And they kept hearing the same name around the gay bars in the area. So what they did was is they they went to Fox Hollow Farms and they asked if they could search his property. Well, him and his wife, Julie, were quick to say no. No, you can't do that. We don't want you to search the farm. Well, this would all change after, after Julie contacts her lawyer and tells her lawyer that they need to have the farm searched. So, lovely Julie. This, none of this would be found without her. So in June 1996, she becomes severely frightened by his behavior and she files for a divorce. Well, they partly reconcile and what they do is they end up going to their, um, their summer condo, which is like on a lake. So all of them go together and Herb says that he has to take care of some business. Well, she takes this time to contact her lawyer and tell her lawyer that, hey, we need to have the how the farm searched because something's going on. Something's not right with Herbert. So her lawyer contacts the police. They get a search warrant, and what they do is they go to the 18-acre estate. Well... It's during this time that Herbert escapes because he knows that they're going to find things. Well, he ends up going to Canada and he goes missing for eight days. And his first night there, he ends up stopping underneath a bridge so he can sleep. And in his car is videotapes. Now, Tony had relayed to the police that he was a serial videographer, so he recorded everything. When he was sleeping in his car, a Mountie, and obviously he's in Canada, the Mountie taps on his car and says, hey, you can't sleep here. And she notices the videotapes in the back of the car. Well, when he is found the next day, which he is found after he commits suicide um, via gunshot wound, 
there's no videotapes so he did something with them and they have not have yet to be recovered to this day and at this campsite they find a three-page suicide note and in this suicide note he talks about how his failed marriage his business um were the reason why he needed to kill himself he feels like he failed in life he's not a good dad his marriage is going to shit because they just they don't work well together lovely right lovely so now he's dead while he's missing so backtrack a little bit while he's missing the police are searching the farm and what they end up finding is they find a burn pile and this is where they find like little pieces of bone and they find some human teeth so they end up searching this area for about a week and then they start packing up their stuff to search into a different area when a neighboring like child a young boy comes over and asks hey what are you looking for so the police they just respond this is a crime scene we are searching for human remains and the kids just like oh like bones the cops are just like what and the kids like oh you're gonna find uh bones by the creek so clearly this boy has found bones that he knows of that have been disposed so they end up they end up finding the bones that he's talking about. Now there's two different areas that the bodies were disposed in. One was the creek and one was a mulch pile. So the mulch pile was on the west part of the property and the creek isn't, isn't even technically on the property. So in the mulch pile he would dispose of the bodies and then like cover them up with leaves and stuff. Because I mean that's what a mulch pile is. So Officially, they identified 8 out of the 11 full set of remains that they could find um, on the property. Now, there was a lot of fragments of bone they found. Uh, when they interviewed a forensic anthropologist in regards to what they found, the anthropologist believes that there was between 17 and 20 uh, bodies on the property and this is because there was 5,500 fragments of bone that were found on the property. 5,500 fragments. That's a lot of bone found. Yikes. So after this they find Herbert dead and what Indiana and Ohio need to do is they need to try and link him to these cases. And the other thing too is is that Herbert fled after they had enough grounds to arrest him. So he fled his arrest and then killed himself. <sighs> yeah. What a sweet man, right? telling you I'm telling you all they needed to do was help him with his mental health I'm telling you it's like I'm preaching to a choir right now Ugh. so the like I said there's 11 victims that they or full sets that they found on the farm and eight of them are identified. So the ones that were identified were Johnny Bayer, then there's Alan Wayne Broussard, Roger Goodlett, which Roger is the friend of Tony Harris. So they found his remains after he was missing. Uh, Richard Hamilton, then we have Stephen Hale, Jeff Jones, Michael Kiern, and Manuel Resendez. And the last three have yet to be identified. Because, I mean, you need a DNA source to be able to identify them. I mean, hopefully they'll do genetic genealogy to find out who they are because they'd be able to extract mitochondrial DNA via your bone marrow. But 
Yeah. So Herbert Baumeister, they tried to connect to the slayings in Indiana and in Ohio for the I-70 Strangler case. So what they did was is that the investigators from both states, they contacted Canada and they had one of like their people go up there to take fingerprints and palm prints because there was a palm print found at one scene and the testing was inconclusive so this is how they aren't able to fully connect him to one of the case to the cases so another thing I found out too is that the people that currently live in the house they have ghost tours go there so there's people that live at the fox hollows farm yowza and um there's been several sightings by the people that live there of dismembered ghosts that are in the woods and um like there was a there was a ghost tour that i was looking at like that I was watching and the lady one of the ladies that was talking said that I can't go in a specific area because I feel weird and it's in Herbert's closet in his bathroom strange right <sighs> but yeah so I hope you guys enjoyed today's true crime case of Herbert Baumeister and the I-70 Strangler. I know it's a lot to take in, and in this case was massive. I, like, I feel so bad for all of these, all of these men and young men that died due to just one man not having his mental health sorted out by people that could have helped him. Because if they, if they did so none of this would have happened. He would have received that it, the help that he needed. So anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Another day of the 25 days of true crime. And I'll see you guys tomorrow in another video. Bye guys.